Okay, looks like we're all set up here. I just want to say hello to everyone. Thanks for joining in person and on Zoom. Uh, my name's Camille, and I'll be teaching the Getting Into Beekeeping course today. It's quite a long course, so might have to take an intermission in there in the middle just to kind of get up, stretch your legs. Uh, we'll be going over some benefits of beekeeping, some that you are probably aware of, some that you may not be. Um, I'm going to try and keep the history page pretty brief because there's a lot to cover there. Uh, why bees are in trouble, how you can help, when and how to begin, and we'll have a couple graphs in here, some general to-dos during the beekeeping season. Um, hive composition placement and terminology is going to be uh, the bulk of the class here. So we're gonna be learning lots of vocabulary, which part of the hive is for what purpose and so on and so forth. Uh, frames is a separate category because it's easier to separate them. There's a, there's a lot to go over there and it can get confusing. Uh, beekeeping tools and apparel, the things that you absolutely need versus the things that will make your life easier. Uh, social organization of bees. So that is to say, which bees are drones, which are workers, what, what do they do, and what does the, hive, uh, the queen do inside the hive as well. Uh, bee breeds, we'll be going over certain breeds that you're probably going to come into contact with, certain breeds that you may want to keep, certain ones that uh, you may want to play with, but um, procuring nukes packages and swarms. This is gonna be kind of brief because we're gonna go over that a little bit uh, in the next class as well. And additional resources. Sorry, I still got a couple people zoning in here. There's some kind of message on the- Oh, on thank the you. There we go. All right, looks like we're all set up here. So some benefits of beekeeping, everyone knows that pollination is a major benefit. Uh, most of our food crops are pollinated by honeybees, uh, flies, beetles, all sorts of different things. Some birds are really good pollinators too. Um, honey is a pretty awesome benefit. So it's a delicious treat. It's a great uh, sugar substitute. You can use it in a lot of different drinks as well. Uh, mead being one of the larger ones, but June being a popular thing. Uh, recently. So local honey can help with allergies. The idea behind this is your local honey has local pollen and if you're allergic to something around uh, the, the bees are going to collect that there's going to be some pollen left over in the honey and as you consume small bits of that your body's more able to handle the allergens as it gets into full-blown season. The wax has a ton of different uses. It can be a little difficult to render, but you're going to have quite a bit of this as a beekeeper, so you can do different things with it. Um, the best use for wax is to remain in the hive as drawn frames. This isn't something you can just buy. So if you have drawn frames, that's a really important resource to hold on to and protect from wax moths and mice and so forth. Propolis is one of those things that a lot of new beekeepers don't really know too much about. It's essentially bee glue. So bees will collect um, tree sap or anything sticky in the wilderness. They will mix it in with their saliva and they'll make this kind of glue paste thing that they, they use to seal all of the hives together. So when you go into your hive and it's stuck together, you have to pry it open with your hive tool. That's because the propolis and some bur comb is keeping everything stuck together. And the propolis is actually kind of cool. It's um, the bees way of sanitizing their hive as well. It's pretty much anti-everything, antiviral, antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, and antihistamine. A lot of people will actually use these in tinctures and ointments. And uh, Fred Selby, actually, he's one of the, the beekeepers that provides the bees here for Chenards. He'll use it as a, a toothache remedy as well. So he'll just chew a little bit of propolis. And of course, it's a really rewarding learning experience. If you're bored and you get into beekeeping, you'll never be bored again. There's always something new to learn. So let's get into a brief history of beekeeping. Don't wanna bore anybody here, but there's some pretty cool stuff in here that can actually help you as a beekeeper. Um, so early humans, I mean, early, early, uh, they began as robbers of bee nests. They would 
basically do a destruction harvest. They would take honey, they would take brood, um, they would use it as food, drink, uh, like mead, medicine, and even currency. So if you had a beehive that you staked out as your own claim, that, that would be um, a form of currency. You'd be really rich if you had a couple of different beehive spots. The earliest records of human interactions with bees, this is the, the robbing that I was talking about, dates back to eight to 6,000 BC in rock paintings, which you'll see photographed here. Uh, the top photo is from Spain and the bottom is from Zimbabwe, which is kind of interesting because this is the first known record of humans using smoke to calm bees during harvest. And these pictures are both from uh, The Hive and the Honeybee, a Dayton publication, originally written by Ella Lingstroth himself. And as animal husbandry began, the earliest domestication of bees uh, dates back to 970 to 930 BC. This is in Tel Rehob, Israel. Uh, the apiary contains somewhere between 75 and 200 cylindrical, cylindrical hives made of sun-dried mud. It's not exactly known how many because it's kind of hard to tell when you're looking at something like this top photo here. It's basically a bunch of mud that eventually disintegrates after all those years, so kind of hard to count there. So hives are built from the cheapest materials available. It seems really expensive today, but they're, they're still trying to use cheaper materials. Um, you can see hives today made out of plastics, woods, all sorts of different things. Um, so gums, which are just sections of tree with um, hives that have made their, made, their, made their life in there, have um, been historically used. Sun-dried mud containers, like the one in Tel Rahav here. Uh, you could use fired clay, reed skep baskets, um, even fishing baskets. This photo down here at the bottom, um, these were old fishing baskets that had been turned into honeybee hives and they're insulated with mud or dung or straw or whatever insulator happens to be around. So the bees will basically live in anything. Throughout the centuries, you've had lots of different uses for bees and their hives. So resource collection is the obvious one. Pollination, of course. Um, warfare is kind of an interesting use for honeybees, however. Uh, rhododendron honey along the Black Sea, you may have heard of mad honey. So the rhododendron honey causes hallucinations and if it's consumed in too high quantities, it can even actually cause death. So if you look into the history books, there are several instances. I think there's five armies that I was reading about that have been completely subdued just by the mad honey going through that region. So if you have rhododendrons, you... Not an issue here. They're so thick along the Black Sea and there's not much else to collect uh -oh. that it can be a problem. Around here in Oregon, I know they grow wild, everybody has them in the yards, but there's so much abundance of resources around, you're not worried about the mad honey around this area. <laughs> Definitely an interesting thing to note, but I've never heard of anything like that around here. Uh, skep booby traps. You, you see the picture in the, in the brick down here of a skep. Kind of interesting, they were actually rigged as booby traps in, um, in Northern Europe. So if the gates fell, they were attached to the skeps. The skeps would be knocked over as the gates fell, and then the attacking armies would be swarmed with honeybees as well. I wouldn't want to charge into that personally. So L.L. Langstroth is basically the father of modern beekeeping. Movable frames have been experimented with. He's definitely not the first person to have come up with this. But uh, he patented the movable hive frame, the movable frame hive, with regards to bee space, which we'll be getting into a little bit later. That's uh, three eighths of an inch in 1852, and today it's still the uh, the most common hive used, particularly in commercial operations, backyard beekeeping, all sorts of things. So, where can you find honeybees today? You can find them in nature. You can find them in backyard, which we'll be focusing on today or in commercial operations. Each of these three scenarios, bees are living in pretty different ways. In nature, you usually find them in living trees. Um, it's, I don't think I've ever seen one in a dead tree before. 
So they'll be in little crevices. The, the trees are pretty rough, so they're going to use a lot of propolis to smooth their nest out, and it's going to be um, more hygienic than most of your backyard or commercial beehives. The backyard is pretty easy as far as a management standpoint because you usually only have somewhere between one and 12 hives in the backyard. They have close proximity, but a backyard beekeeper can tend to the bees quite a bit more than say a commercial beekeeper. So you'll have markings on the front of your hive to prevent drift. You'll be able to treat each individual hive instead of as a whole. The commercial operations are incredibly important and we need to keep them around. Um, they're not without their flaws. There's a lot of intense management going on. There's no spacing whatsoever. There's a lot of drift and there's a lot of disease that's spread in this way. Basically, all of the commercial hives from all around the country come to California to pollinate the almonds for two weeks out of the year. And they're all in the same area and just basically a, a giant honeybee city. So it's got some drawbacks to it, but this is where all of your nukes and packages come from. This is how we're continuing the honeybee population. And without this, we're not gonna have a lot of our commercial crops. So we really have the commercial beekeepers to thank for this. A couple of reasons why bees are in trouble. Um, the nature of their foraging habits makes them very susceptible to pesticides. So the most important thing I can impart to you is if you're going to spray any of your plants with anything, just don't do it when they're blooming. When they're out of bloom, it's usually safe to treat. But during bloom, anything that hits that flower is going to be susceptible to being picked up and spread to the honeybee colonies. Uh, like I was mentioning briefly before, uh, commercial pollination can spread the disease, uh, diseases and pests, particularly varroa mites, eastern fallow brood, American fallow brood, these types of really dangerous things for honeybees. Urbanization and changes in agriculture leading to loss of habitat. Uh, Monocropping makes it so there's uh, not, a, not really good forage around. Urbanization can be a pro or a con. Lately, a lot of people have been into pollinator plants, so you see urban areas actually being a hot spot for honeybees rather than a kind of desolate concrete area. Colony collapse disorder isn't necessarily something that is from one specific thing. It's a combination of all these things coming together in order to kill the colony. Um, poor forage, Weather, climate makes a big difference. We had a really, really rough year last year. We had way too much rain. We had late frosts. Queens weren't able to mate with drones at the proper time. So a lot of these factors really made a hard year for us last year. Um, also contributed to poor forage and poor, because of poor pollination, we didn't get many crops. I think I got two apples on my tree last year and that's when I had two, two beehives in the backyard. Uh, so poor forage leads to poor nutrition, and just like humans, if you're poorly nourished, you're more likely to succumb to pests and disease like mites and your foul brood and your sack brood and your chalk brood and all these things. Uh, pesticides are an ever-present problem. If something is flowering, pesticides are used, that's really going to impact your colony. So all of these factors coming together is colony collapse disorder. You can definitely do things to minimize um, each of these bullet points here, but as a whole, there are a lot of things that are just simply out of your control. And I think my figure down here is a little bit off. Uh, 30 to 50% losses are common. Um, in backyard scenarios, I think it's closer to 60% these days. It's pretty high. I feel less guilty now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> A lot of us have been having a lot of losses. I, I myself actually had 50% loss this year. So I've got two surviving hives that are incredibly strong. I had one hive that began weak and just never really took off and one hive that just got demolished by varroa mites. Despite best efforts, they were treated, but 
it was just too much. Um, so how you can help kind of goes with colony collapse disorder. Um, bees forage quite a distance. So you're not necessarily having a beehive that isn't associated with any other bees, unless you're really, really rural. Bees can typically forage somewhere around three miles. So they're integrating with all the other hives around them, all the other bees, the native bees, um, all sorts of different things are going on here. In a pinch, they can fly up to 10 miles. You don't really wanna see that happening. You're, you're gonna see some struggles, but typically speaking, three miles is pretty average for honeybee foragers. Um, as far as responsible beekeeping, it's not something that can be learned in a day or a year or five years or 10 years. It's something that's continually growing. So talking to your peers, being in bee clubs can really help, but really there's nothing better than actual experience. So the more you're out there with the bees, the more colonies you have, the more uh, experimentation you do with breeds, the better you're going to be. Building on that same point, um, going to your beekeeping associations and the great thing as you continue to build your knowledge and sharing your knowledge with others is always really helpful too. The beekeeping community, especially around here, isn't terribly huge, but it's a pretty tight knit group. So if you go to Lynn Benton Beekeepers Association, for instance, they meet about once a month. They're all just a really awesome group of people. They're willing to share their knowledge. They've got lots of cool speakers. So uh, keep in touch with the community and keep on learning. When and how to begin, we're kind of getting into the bulk of the material here. So when, going to hit you hard right off the bat here, it's expensive. Um, you should consider costs. You should start as early as possible. Uh, beekeeping has always been an expensive hobby. It is continuing to get more expensive as inflation rises. No way around it, unfortunately. Um, but if you start really early, you get little pieces here and there, it's definitely doable for just about anybody. And upfront costs, if you start with nothing and build, are going to be pretty high, but it will get easier over time as you get all the equipment. Let's see. Little explanation on this uh, fourth bullet point down here. Consider buying set amounts of bee equipment each month the hive skeleton is uh, just the boxes I'm talking about, not inside them. So they can get kind of pricey for pieces of wood, but uh, if you do it in small increments, then it's not so much of a problem. The idea is you do want to have your hive set up available and ready and in place and painted, completely ready to go when the bees arrive. And that's usually somewhere around April or May, depending on if you get a package or a new. So uh, when, general seasonal tasks in the apiary, and by general, I really mean general. This is basically what you do year after year. The time frame is going to shift depending on the weather and depending on your colony and a couple different factors. So this is a pretty loose, um, a pretty loose build right here. Winter is what we're going through right now. Obviously, the snow outside. Um, so this is when, if you have existing colonies, you prepare any equipment, you would build any new equipment that you would need. Uh, weather watch, if you have existing colonies, if you see a day where there's temperatures of 55 degrees or above, and it's not too windy or rainy, you can get out and do some emergency feeding. Um, expanding your beekeeping knowledge, a good book, a class like this, going to your local beekeeping meeting, this can really help you throughout the year. And this is also the time to pre-order your bees. Uh, we typically start pre-orders starting the first week of January, and then we stop right around April when the packages arrive. So in April and May, this is when you're going to be doing your installations and you're going to be starting your feeding for existing colonies. So install your packages in your nukes, get them all situated and ready to go. Make sure to feed them heavily at this time because you're trying to build them up for the season. You're trying to get their population big enough that you can actually harvest the honey. Um, this is also, once you start getting them kind of settled, when you're going to begin your treatments for burrow mites. It's good to start early, keep up your integrated pest management and get them completely gone or close to completely gone by the time they go into winter and you can no longer treat. Um, April, May, you'll also be watching your colony expansion. 
as you get to about 70% full in one box, you're going to add another box and continue doing that until you get to your honey super. Uh, May and June, this is the honey flow. So you're going to start seeing lots of things blooming. Uh, you're going to start looking at blackberries are the, the main thing to look for. When they start blooming, that's the biggest honey flow of the year. And that's when your honey super should be on. Hopefully your colony has grown to the point that they can continue to bring all of this harvest in and they can get a box or two of honey for you. So your honey supers or your honey boxes are going to be added at this time. And you'll actually stop supplemental feeding at this time as well. The moment your honey super goes on, you stop feeding them sugar water so that they don't store sugar water in your honey super. You don't wanna harvest honey, uh, honey sugar water. You'd rather harvest pure honey. Um, also important during this time of honey supering that you don't treat for mites. There are a couple of medications where if you absolutely need to, you can treat during the honey flow, but it's not recommended. So try and get your mites down before the honey flow begins. Uh, July and August, you're going to be harvesting your honey. And that may seem a bit early. They're still going to continue bringing in honey. But the idea is if you harvest this early, they still have enough time to build up before winter and have enough supplies to get them through. You're going to be continuing your hive inspections. You're going to uh, make sure you, you uh, squish any queen cups that are appearing. You don't want them to swarm at this point. It's too late for them to swarm. Uh, watch for late season robbing as well. At this point, you've done your honey harvest and maybe a little bit of honey left over that they're cleaning inside the hive. So there's gonna be a lot of honey smell going on. They're also gathering a lot of resources and they're gonna to wanna to protect those. Other honeybees know that and they're going to want to go to the weaker colonies and take all of their honey. Um, July and August, we're treating for Varroa again. So do your mite checks, do your treatments, keep up on it. And hopefully by winter, they're going to be at a manageable level. September and October, we're continuing to watch for robbing. This is other honeybees, yellow jackets, um, all sorts of different things. Uh, you can find some larger robbers as well. Apparently skunks love honeybees. Your last treatment for Varroa is going to be in September, October as well, unless you're using oxalic acid, which I don't have much experience with, and I'm not really going to be covering that topic today. Um, as the rains begin, it's going to be a lot more moist out. They're not going to be able to consume your sugar liquid. So you'll stop feeding uh, liquid sugar feed in September, October, and begin to feed granulated sugar instead, or a sugar fondant. Yes, the patties. And your winterizing equipment goes on September, October as well, before the rains really start and you can't actually do it anymore. Mm -hmm. Would it be possible to ask to get this presentation emailed to us as well? We're actually posting the entire presentation on YouTube. Okay, perfect. So what kind of a hive setup should I choose? This is a really personal question and everybody has their own opinions, but you're the only person who can really answer this. Bees are incredibly flexible about their houses, like I mentioned in the history portion of the class. So you can make them a skep hive out of a fishing basket. You can make them a clay cylinder. Uh, you really shouldn't be doing that these days because that's kind of a destruction harvest method and you can't treat. But uh, it just kind of goes to show that they're very flexible and they'll live in whatever house you give to them. So you need to weigh your options carefully, figure out which hive setup works best for you. Um, there are lots of different hive setups. We're gonna go into this in the next slide. So you need to consider how much weight you can carry. You need to consider um, how often you're gonna be in the hive. You're going to consider how you'd like to extract your honey because some hive setups you can or can't extract in certain ways. And like I mentioned before, it is pretty expensive to start beekeeping. So if you choose one method, one hive setup and you wanna to change to another, that can be pretty difficult. Um, keeping in the loop with your beekeeping friends and peers, you may be able to swap equipment here and there, go to Lynn Benton Beekeeping Association, and they, they, they sell used equipment and stuff. So it's not impossible, but it is difficult to change your setup once you've begun.
So removable frame hive types. These are the types of hives, unlike your skep hives and your fishing trap hives that are usable and harvestable by humans. These are your non-kill methods of beekeeping. The Langstroth hive is what we're going over today. It's what I'm most familiar with. It's what I use in my backyard and here at the store. Um, there are two different sizes, so eight frame and 10 frame. Literally, it's just a difference of two frames. So it's just a couple inches difference, but it makes a big impact in, as far as weight. The Flow Hive is an adaptation of the Langstroth Hive. Basically, the Flow Hive is a Langstroth Hive with a special honey super. So you can interchange the parts as long as you're careful. Uh, the top bar hive and the horizontal hive are very similar. The top bar hive came first. The horizontal hive is kind of an adaptation and kind of an interesting mix between a top bar hive and a Linkstroth hive. The cool thing about the top bar and the horizontal hive is if you can't lift a bunch, you're only lifting one frame at a time instead of an entire box of frames. So you'll be lifting 10 pounds instead of 100. Makes a pretty big difference. But treatment and feeding can be really difficult in these hives. Bees typically want to go up. That's just their natural way. They'll go up in their tree. They'll go up in their hive. So having a horizontal hive does pose some problems. Uh, the German plastic hive can be basically any hive type. The idea is it's used with plastic, so it has more insulation properties and it can be, it can be cheaper. The idea was it's cheaper. I don't think that's necessarily the case anymore. Um, the Slovenian cabinet or AZ hive isn't really practical around here, mostly because of its size and its management, but I put it in here just because it's really, really cool. So you see it's an entire cabin over here and I've seen Slovenian trailer, Slovenian single cabinet, Slovenian actual houses, but essentially this is a bee house where you pull open your box and you go through it like a filing cabinet. So kind of interesting in that respect, and the bees can be insulated during the winter time. They're actually inside. But as you can see on the outside of this house, all the entrances are on the outside, so they can come and go freely. Hive placement is really important. So where you have the hive, which direction you have the entrance does make a difference. Um, you should have your hives built, painted, and in place, ready to go at least a month before your bees arrive. You don't want any off gases from paint or you run the risk of having your bees abscond or just simply leave. So consider how many hives you'll have. From a backyard standpoint, two hives is a pretty good number. There's not too much more management from one hive to two hives and you actually stand to benefit one hive or the other. You have a weak hive, you have a strong hive, you can put some of the frames over to the weaker hive and bolster it. Um, you can, if you have a queen failure, you can put a frame of brood into the, the failed queen area and requeen it, and you're not really out all that brood. You can swap stuff around. Mm. As long as you're sure that there are no brood diseases. Um, hives can be marked, so bees recognize home. Bees are particularly good at recognizing shapes and there are recent studies where bees will actually recognize odd and even numbers as well. So kind of cool. I think they were using playing cards and a simple water solution as a reward and a sugar syrup solution as a reward. And they, they actually figured out the odd versus the even numbers pretty easily. Um, as far as marked, you can mark your hives with basically anything. Uh, a lumber crayon works, uh, bee decals work, uh, different colors, different shapes, just something around the edges so that they know which home is theirs. Uh, the only thing about colors is trying to avoid red. They don't really see red, it's more of a shade of gray for them. So if you're looking at different colors, see anything but red. Southern and Eastern exposures are best. You are considering wind. You don't want them to have a lot of wind on the entrance that can really help um, keep them in the hive when they should be out foraging. You want them to have a, an easy takeoff and landing point. Morning sun, important on the morning part, needs to shine on the entrance. Uh, the morning sun wakes them up, starts them foraging. If they're facing north and they don't get a whole lot of sun, they're not gonna wake up early. They're not gonna be out foraging for a couple of hours, which could make a big difference later on. Deciduous trees, 
Um, pros and cons here. Really great because they have good afternoon shade, which cools the hive in the summer. They have uh, no leaves in the winter, so excellent sun in the winter, as long as you don't have a problem with falling branches and you can keep an eye on the hive. I have mine under a flowering plum and it works out great for me, but I do keep up on tree maintenance. So uh, important that you don't have a bunch of branches falling on the hive. If you have to make a decision between too much shade and too much sun, err on the side of too much sun because the shade can be really detrimental to actually getting them out and actually getting them foraging. And if you drive down uh, the farm fields in California, you'll see it out in the sun all the time, 120 degrees. It's not great for them, but they do, they do fine. Um, as far as backyard beekeeping and keeping bees within close proximity of fences and kids and dogs and neighbors and things, you want at least six feet in front of hive for their flyway. They'll kind of disperse after six feet. They're not going to be as um, protective at six feet. They're, 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 they just need six feet to themselves, basically. Can I ask a question about Sadie? Mm -hmm. You want me to wait for you? No, go for it. Um, where I got mine situated to get morning sun, uh -huh. but there's a bank, which is uh, blackberries, which is good, mm -hmm. but probably early afternoon, a little in shade, just like a tree. Okay. So they're only getting a half a day of full sun. And maybe... As long as it starts in the morning, it should be fine. Keep an eye on the entrance and see what they do. If they kind of slow down their foraging, there's not as much activity in the afternoon, maybe consider moving the hive. But if they're getting dappled sun in the afternoon and they have already been in and out, they've already got that, that rhythm going, then it should be fine. Well, yeah, they're not getting dappled. They're just in the hill. You know, it's a really steep hill. And the sun goes behind it probably mid-afternoon. Okay. In the summer. Early summer. So maybe move where I get more full sun. I would try moving them to more full sun. Um, if if are they a live hive right now or are they are dead out? Wooden boxes. Okay, try moving to a little bit more sun. Then. Mm -hmm. They're pretty good at regulating the temperature. Okay. Let's see. Uh, be a good neighbor. All neighbors are different, so. Maybe ask them, hey, I'm a beekeeper. If you've got any questions, just reach out to me. I feel that when people know they can ask questions, they're a lot more comfortable. Um, maybe you have a neighbor that doesn't care. That's fine too. But it's a good idea to just let your neighbors know, hey, here's what's going on. I'm available. Like, uh, There aren't too many bee laws that you can actually get in trouble for, which is kind of cool around this area. Uh, Philomath Corvallis and Albany nuisance laws are the only laws that actually apply to backyard beekeeping. And that's the same law that you can call the cops on teenager for, for having their music too loud at two in the morning. But it's always good to keep people in the loop. And if you happen to drop a jar of honey off for your neighbors once in a while, I think they'll be pretty happy. Um, there are some beekeeping laws as far as state laws that uh, are somewhat new here. So if you have apiaries, five or more hives, this, uh, this would apply to you. If you have four hives, don't need to worry about this at all. But if you have five or more hives, um, the Oregon Department of Agriculture is collecting a fee. So it's $10 plus 50 cents per hive. The registration has to be filled out uh, before June 1st of each year. And what a colony is, um, is a full-sized healthy colony. Your late season swarms don't count. Your new colonies don't count. Um, late season splits, that's fine too. But if you have full-sized healthy colonies um, exceeding four colonies, this is when you would register. And all proceeds go straight to OSU Honeybee Labs to help with varroa prevention and good forage. They're doing a couple of uh, studies right now that are taking in pollen samples and they're basically determining whether the pollen is good for the bees or simply abundant. Uh, the way Ramesh Sahili puts it is um, we're trying to figure out if the bees are eating salads or french fries, because you love french fries, but you should be eating salads. So I've got a couple of websites written down here. You can uh, take a photo of this. You can go straight to the website. They've got a lot more information there as well. 
And we also have a residential beekeeping booklet right here. And that's available um, at this bottom link as well. That has a lot of the information filled out as well. Okay, we're really getting into the meat of things here. Um, apologize if you guys have been beekeeping for a while and you know this stuff, but for any of you who are completely new to this, there's a lot of terminology out there that can be confusing, and I'm just going to go over each piece of a hive um, and what it's for and different names for it, because sometimes you'll see one piece of a colony with eight different names, and that's, that's confusing. So this is one full-size Langstroth hive. This is your uh, full season setup, unless you'd like to do an additional honey super, which some people do. So starting from the top here and working to the bottom, you have your telescoping top. This is just the lid. It keeps the rainwater out. Uh, it keeps the bees inside their box and not exposed to the elements. The feeder, which is not pictured, um, can be a, a couple different things, and we will get into that a little bit later. Your inner cover can be a couple different things. In this photo, I have a Vivaldi inner cover, which is a tall inner cover, which can house a feeder or it can house wintering supplies or simply act as ventilation in summer. But um, we're, we're gonna get into this a little more, alert, more later as well. We have a honey super down below the Vivaldi inner cover. And inside the honey super, we have 10 Western frames. There may or may not be a queen excluder depending on your use. Some people don't use one, some people do. But this goes in between your honey super and your, your brood boxes down here. Um, we have two deep brood boxes. This is where your bees will nest. This is what you don't take. You take from the honey super, you don't take from the brood boxes. So your brood boxes have 20 deep frames, 10 frames per box. Uh, down here, you this little piece of wood sticking out. It's not inserted properly, so you can see it in the picture, but this is your entrance reducer. And your entrance reducer is going to help with robbing or it can help with temperature. Um, it can help with all sorts of things throughout the year. So it's got a couple different sized entrances on it. Uh, below is your screen bottom board. This is the base of the hive. Um, it's screen, but it does have a slot at the back so that you can insert a Corex board or a different type of mite board and that will seal it off so it keeps a little bit warmer, or you can remove the mite board and keep it really ventilated. The hive stand is not photoed here, but you really don't wanna be just setting this entire setup on the lawn because that could cause all sorts of trouble. So make sure you have it propped up on something. There are commercial hive stands, which can get pretty pricey. Um, there are just pallets. A lot of the, the commercial beekeepers use a pallet and they'll put four hives per pallet. Personally, I like to use cinder blocks. Two cinder blocks for a Langstroth hive like this works perfectly. And it's just a couple bucks. So these are all completed hives before supering, but they do look a little bit different. Um, just different hive configurations for different styles of beekeeping. Um, you see over here on the left, three Western brood boxes. And this equates to two deep brood boxes. This is enough to house your colony to allow them to raise their babies and have their own food supplies in here. The reason we may do uh, three Western brood boxes versus your two standard deep brood boxes is the Western brood boxes are a lot easier to lift. So from a management standpoint, the Western boxes are easier. Typically on site, I have your, your standard configuration with the two deep brood boxes, but at home, I actually do the Westerns. So it makes it a lot easier when you're having to lift a bunch of all at once. So eight frame versus 10 frame. It sounds complicated, but it's really simple. The only difference is you can fit eight frames into an eight frame hive, but you can fit 10 frames into a 10 frame hive. So the difference between the two hives is about two inches. They're the same height, they're the same depth, they're just a little bit different as far as the width. Uh, the weight is the biggest difference though. 
A lot of people have gone to your eight frame equipment, which isn't the standardized equipment, but it's easier for a lot of backyarders because a full deep brood box in an eight frame hive is typically around 80 pounds versus hundred pounds in your 10 frame. Two box styles with many names. This is kind of what I was talking about before about how sometimes the vocabulary can be a little bit confusing. I've been talking about your brood boxes or your deep hive bodies down here. Um, it can also be called a brood nest or any number of other names. But when you're talking about brood chambers, brood nests, deep boxes, or deep hive bodies, this is where the bulk of your colony resides. And this is where you don't take resources. And uh, the height down here, not to be confused, um, this is the height of the boxes. The height of the frames is a teeny bit different. Your honey supers can be called all sorts of different things, but the bottom line is the honey supers are what you take for yourself. You may leave a honey super on the colony for overwintering. Some people do, some people don't. Um, I like to leave an extra box on there just in case they run out of food and I'm not able to get in. Kind of like last year, we, we didn't have any opportunities to do emergency feeding until pretty late in the year. And having that extra honey box on my hive really saved them. So let's build a hive. I know we just did that, but we're going to get into the functionality of each box rather than just the name here. So your screen bottom board, we're working from the bottom to the top this time. Uh, like I said, it's the base of the hive and provides the entrance for your bees. This is also where your, um, your entrance reducer comes in. It fits right along the bottom side here. And the placement is it sets on top of your hive stand and your brew boxes are set on top of it. Your hive boxes or your brood chambers. It will house the colony, the brood, the food, the workers, the drone, and the queen all reside within these boxes. Um, typically, you will begin with only one of these boxes. When you get a package or a nuke, you're not going to have a full-size population, and you're probably not going to start with completely drawn frames. So you'll start with this one box and you'll wait until they begin to use the frames within. The 70% rule is usually what I use when building my colony. So in a 10 frame box, that's pretty easy. When seven frames are being utilized by the bees and you've got three frames that are unused, you don't want them to run out of room. You're only checking in on once about uh, once a week or once every two weeks. So once you find that they're using 70% of that material, you'll add another box and allow for more expansion. Uh, two brood boxes seems to be the magic number. You can just continue building your colony until they get enormous, but from a management standpoint, that's a complete nightmare, and you only want really two brood boxes and up to probably two or three honey supers at a time. So your queen excluder goes directly on top of your brood boxes. This is basically to keep your brood boxes separated from your honey supers. You want the queen to be down in your brood boxes and you want worker bees to be up in your honey super. So the reason the screen is the size it is, is the worker bees can go through the screen. The queen is too large to go through the screen. So you won't wind up with eggs and brood mixed in with your honey for the table. There are a couple different types of queen excluders. Everybody likes a different type. Personally, I kind of hate all of them. Um, <laughs> There is metal, there's plastic, and there's wood bound. The wood bound, I'm actually really excited about this year. It's kind of a new addition to the beekeeping department. It, uh, it has a bit of a spacer on it as well. So you've got a bee space on either side of the queen excluder. And I'm hoping that this is going to prevent the crazy amount of burr comb that usually forms in the queen excluders. And it's gonna be easier to pry off without damaging any of the structure. So definitely gonna experiment with that this year and I'll get back to you guys. Um, functionality, we've gone through that. Placement sets on top of your uppermost brood box and below your honey supers. As far as when you place the queen excluder, some people place it immediately when they put their honey supers on. This is going to impede the process of the bees building in your honey super. So if you have a honey super that doesn't have drawn frames, it's just an empty box. It's a good idea to leave the queen excluder off until they begin construction because that's really going to help them go straight up 
start building. And then once they're already building, they will continue the project. You can insert that queen excluder before the queen gets up and begins laying. So it can be a little bit tricky. You, you, can, you can make it work or you can make it kind of a difficult thing depending on when you add your queen excluder. Um, your upper hive box or honey super. Uh, like I mentioned before, this is the honey that you're going to be taking for yourself or the honey that you're going to be leaving for the bees over winter. Um, goes above the queen excluder and below your Vivaldi or your standard inner cover. These are inter interchangeable inner covers. Western frames are placed inside these boxes. They're quite a bit shallower than your deep hive boxes. It is possible to use a deep hive box as a honey super, but once you harvest that, you'll understand why people don't do it. Um, a brood box can be incredibly heavy when it's full of honey. And when you're lifting way up here above your head, you don't want to be lifting a hundred pound brood box full of honey. It's just not fun. It's also kind of dangerous, especially if you're on the ladder to do it. Uh, so the, the medium supers are definitely the way to go in this instance. Again, the 70% rule just with your brood boxes. Once the bees have finished filling about 70% of your frames, you're gonna to wanna to add another honey box. Uh, some beekeepers will harvest the full honey box and put a brand new empty one on there. Um, some beekeepers will just continue building and harvest all at once. Totally up to you. Yes. In terms of per season, what's a reasonable amount of super honey supers that you would? Um, around this area, typically the number of honey supers you'll see in a really good season, you'll see probably two or three honey supers. Last year was terrible and we barely got one full. <laughs> but uh, on a really good year, you can get a couple honey supers on there. Okay. So far, I've yet to see that year, okay. but we're, we're getting it there. Exists. <laughs> it exists. Great. If you're in California or Florida or somewhere where the seasons are a lot longer, you can get quite a few more boxes on there. Sure. I've seen hives with four and five honey supers on there. This is insane. But our climate doesn't allow for that, that kind of honey storage. So your Vivaldi inner cover. Um, try to make this simple. There are inner covers. This is one of the inner covers. There's the standard inner cover, which is just a thin strip of wood with a little hole in the center, and then your Vivaldi inner cover, which is a little bit taller. The functionality here is actually really important, whether it's a standard or the Vivaldi inner cover. So the inner cover goes into your telescoping top, and it goes flush onto your honey super or your or wherever it goes. Um, depending on the season, your Vivaldi inner cover may be on top of your brew boxes, or it may be on top of your honey supers. But the idea is it always follows your telescoping top. It's always connected to the telescoping top. And it prevents your telescoping top from being glued to your frames. Because the telescoping top goes over the top of your boxes, it's really hard to pry it off. So you want it to be on your inner cover. So the inner cover is stuck and not the lid itself. Um, I have played with this before just to see how much of a pain it is. Trust me, keep the inner cover, it's worth it. Um, so it also provides extra ventilation. The Vivaldi inner cover has got four little ventilation holes on the side. So little breezes will pop in there. It'll help with the summer heat. It will help with moisture escaping in the wintertime as well, which is really important, especially around this area where we have such wet winters. Um, you can use it all season long. It's actually named for Vivaldi's Four Season Concerto. So you can use it in the springtime and in the fall for feeding. You can use it in the summer purely for ventilation. You can use it in the winter to add water wicking material. So you can add um, hamster shavings, you can add pine needles, you can add burlap, a bath towel, a moisture board, any type of moisture wicking material, as long as you change it out once in a while. This will really help through the winter and it'll preserve your telescoping top because once they get soggy, they pretty much stay soggy. And getting to the telescoping top, we're almost done with the really long boring part. Sorry, guys. The functionality of the telescoping top is not only just a lid, it's also some rain protection. So there are a lot of different types of telescoping tops out there, but there's definitely um, a 
functional telescoping top versus an inexpensive telescoping top. You wanna to make sure that it goes over the top of the box it's on. If you have um, a telescoping cover that's simply a piece of board that's flush with the rest of your hive, you're not gonna have protection from rain. And that's really not a good thing, especially in this area. Too much moisture, rain getting into your hive, that'll kill your colony. So having your telescoping top going over the top of, uh, over the top of your hive and over the sides is really important. Um, many of our telescoping tops have an aluminum top on there. So that will help with uh, temperature regulation as well. And they're heavy. It's important that they're heavy because raccoons and things like to get into beehives and they're industrious little critters. They can pull things off. So having a heavy top will help prevent uh, your larger robbers from getting in as well. When it comes to bears, they're gonna get in if, get, if they wanna get in. Uh, so you're really looking at squirrels and skunks and stuff like that. Frame sizes. So you have your deep hive box and your Western hive box. You also have your deep frames and your Western frames. It's really important to get the right size frame for the right size box. Um, otherwise your hive won't close properly or you'll wind up with a ton of bur comb and a huge mess. It's possible in a pinch, if you only have Western frames and you need to put them in a deep hive body, you can do it, but you're going to wind up with a deep frame worth of bur comb. So always good to have extra frames on hand. I try and keep uh, uh, bulk discounts going on all my frames out there. So if you get a couple of extra, definitely not a bad thing. Um, uh, going over this again, your 10 frame hive configuration, um, 10 frames per box. So two deep boxes is 20 frames. One Western box, you'll be using 10 frames. The eight frame hive configuration, eight frames will fit per box. So two deep boxes is 16 deep frames versus one Western box is eight Western frames. Now I told you guys I was gonna be getting into B space a little bit later. Uh, B space is three eighths of an inch. And this is part of the reason why LL Langstroth is so famous. Um, the measurement in which bees will not construct comb or fill it with propolis is about three eighths of an inch. Um, so what he's done here is between frames, you've got two B spaces to allow for some comb production. You have a B space between the wall of your hive and the next frame, the bottom of your frame and the bottom of your hive, the top of your frame and the top of the next box, all three eighths of an inch. So it doesn't always work, but most of the time you're going to have a pretty easy time moving those frames around and not having them glued together. They're still going to be stuck, but they're not going to be completely impossible. Um, obviously, bees don't read our books. This photo here is improperly drawn comb where they have actually done something called cross combing. Instead of combing across the, uh, the foundation here, they've combed against the next foundation. So there's little strips of wax versus an entire sheet of wax. You'd have to cut this completely away and have them redraw it. But most of the time these measurements work out so this doesn't happen. Uh, types of foundation. So just like a frame is to a picture, the foundation is the picture, the frame is the frame itself. So we're talking about what goes inside the frame here. Um, there's a lot of different things you can do here. You can use right cell plastic. You see the yellow and the black here. Um, these are incredibly durable and they're reusable. So if you have your right cell plastic here, you have improperly drawn comb like we saw on this photo here. You don't have to throw the entire frame away. You can simply use your hive tool, scrape that wax away and they'll rebuild on that same frame right away. Uh, real wax foundation, a lot of people really like the, the real wax aspect of it. They think that bees take to it better. Um, it's better for the bees. It's also incredibly fragile. If you're just starting out, I'd recommend going the right cell or at least mostly right cell on a couple little foundationless or real wax. Um, real wax can be used for cut comb honey. So depending on the type of foundation, 
your methods of honey harvesting are going to be different. Um, cut comb honey is basically when you take a foundationless or uh, a frame uh, made of real wax and you take a cookie cutter and you cut out the wax and the honey together and then you sell that or you give that to your friends as is. So they receive a box with honeycomb and honey, which is kind of cool. And you can use the, the wax as chewing gum too. It's actually an earlier form of chewing gum, but it's not for everyone. And if you want to spin your honey, say in a centrifuge, if you've got a lot of honey, you want to put it through that centrifuge, get liquid honey out of it. This isn't the best way to go because a lot of the centrifuges go fast enough that they'll actually destroy frames that are on pure wax or foundationless. So that's where the right cell plastic comes in. It'll stand up to the centrifuge. Uh, drawn comb, not necessarily a foundation, but I wanted to put it in here because it's a, there's a lot of confusion with what is drawn comb. Drawn comb is simply built comb. You see on your right cell plastic foundation, this is just a sheet with a cookie cutter uh, hexagons in it. The drawn comb is actually full of deep cells that are workable. So they're about the length of a bee body themselves. They can be filled with brood or with um, wax or with bee bread. These are difficult to get. You can't just go buy them. You have to have your bees draw these frames out for you. So once you get these frames, it's really important to keep them in good shape. The easiest way to keep them is in the hive itself with the bees. If you have a dead out situation, you can keep the dead out by just sealing the entire box off, make sure no rodents or anything can get in there. Uh, you can also freeze these frames and they do pretty well that way as well. Real wax foundation, I'm not gonna get into wiring too much. I do have the uh, URL here if you'd like to check it out a little bit later, but especially if you're dealing with deep real wax, you're going to need some extra support in there so that they don't crumble. Uh, so take a look if you'd like, but if you're a beginner, there's a lot to learn already. I recommend going with your plastic right cell for now. Getting towards the end, I know it's kind of a long class. Um, beekeeping tools and apparel. There are absolute essentials and then there's a lot of fun toys out there. So it's important to know what you actually need versus what can make the job easier and what's just simply fun to have. Your hive tool is an extension of your hand. It should never leave your hand when you're in the bee yard. Um, this beekeeping with movable frame Langstroth hives wouldn't be possible without the hive tool. Your frames are going to be stuck together. Your boxes are gonna be stuck together. You're going to need to be moving things that are really sticky or really hard to move or really hard to get to with just your fingers. So you're gonna need your pry bar to help you along the way. Um, most of your good hive tools are actually sharp as well. So if you have improperly drawn comb, like you see in this photo here, you're gonna use your hive tool to kind of cut that out. That's a, your improperly drawn wax or your fur comb. Your smoker is an incredible tool as well. Some people don't like using smoke. They can use uh, sugar water, a couple other methods, but I really stand by the need for a smoker. It's not just for the beekeeper. It's not necessarily that the bees don't like the smoke. This is actually a really life-saving tool for the bees. So the smoke can be used to control the bees, not only to their temperament, but also their movement. So you are expelling smoke, which blocks their pheromone receptors. They smell the smoke. They don't smell the alarm pheromone. It keeps them calm. Um, they don't really want to be blasted with a bunch of smoke. So if you have a bunch of bees on tops of your frames and you're trying to put your equipment back together, you can crush a couple hundred bees putting your equipment back together. A few quick puffs and all the bees go back down into the frame so you can safely put your equipment back together. Um, as far as apparel, this really depends on the beekeeper. Um, it depends on how comfortable you are. It depends on maybe your budget. Uh, for a beginner beekeeper, I fully recommend a full suit, a good pair of gloves, um, obviously uh, good shoes. Don't, don't wear sandals out there, it's not fun. <laughs> um, some people will go out in a light sweater and a veil. Some people use gloves, some people don't. Um, 
Take it from me, getting stung in the cuticle is not fun. I like to wear gloves, but you don't have to wear gloves. Some people wear heavy leather gloves. Some people will simply wear a pair of vinyl gloves because it's difficult for the bees to recognize that as human skin. And it's also difficult for them to kind of walk on there and sting. So they don't necessarily want to sting through the vinyl. Um, the vinyl also sticks to the frames and rips. So you have to take that into account as well but that can be an alternative to the heavy leather gloves that uh, kind of impede your, your dexterity. Social organization. Um, this is a massive topic, so I'm gonna try and keep it kind of short. Um, there are male bees and female bees. The drones are male and they're not always present in the hive, but they can be confusing when it comes to finding the queen. The queen and the drone look very similar, so there are some differences that you should note. The drone has eyes that are facing upward and are very large. Reason being is their sole purpose in life is to mate with the queen, and when they go to drone congregation areas, they fly significantly lower than the queen, so they're always looking up, hence the upward facing eyes. The queen herself, um, she is much larger than a worker, but she has a kind of a conical abdomen, whereas the drone has a very rounded abdomen. She also has the worker eyes. So if you see big buggy eyes, not the queen. Um, drones are kind of interesting because depending on the breed of bee you have, they're the ones that are going to show the color characteristics. So your workers are pretty much your workers. Carniola and Italian, standard survivor, Caucasian, the workers look like the workers. The drones will show different color variations. So they can tell you a little bit about what kind of bee you have. Um, your queen does a couple different things in her life, but for the most part, all she does is she lays eggs and she distributes pheromones throughout the hive to keep everything kind of in concert. Uh, she will leave the hive as a virgin queen to go and mate. She'll mate for a couple of weeks with several different drones. I think it's usually somewhere around 12 to 20 drones that she mates with, and then she's done for life. She goes back into the hive. She lays uh, a good queen can lay about 2,000 eggs a day. Uh, so that is two sides of the frame, one full frame. Um, as far as workers, this is the bulk of what's happening in the hive. Most of your bees in the hive are going to be workers and different stages of workers will perform different tasks. So a brand new worker that just hatched out, its first task is to clean its own cell and to remove the, the, the pupil casing. It will then feed the other brood, it will attend to the queen, it will do lots of house chores as a young bee. As it becomes a little bit older, it'll start doing cleaning duties towards the outside of the hive. It will defend the hive. It will be a mortician, remove the dead, the dead bees from the hive. Um, towards the end of their life is when they actually become foragers. And once they become foragers, unless something bad happens and there's a lack of brood, they remain foragers until they die. So depending on the age of the bee, it's got a, it's got a very different role in the hive. And you can kind of tell um, the age of the bee just by looking at them too. The young bees, the, the ones that have just emerged are usually almost pure white. They're kind of wet and fuzzy looking. Oh, and when you're looking to spot the queen, uh, another thing here, uh, the thorax is very different from worker to queen. The workers have a very fuzzy thorax versus the queen has a big bald spot here. So that's another thing that you can look for when you're searching for the queen. Um, talking about brood. So brood is essentially just bee babies. Um, they develop in the cells from egg to larva to pupa to adult, uh, but their adolescent stages collectively are called brood. Brood is pretty easily distinguishable between all these three different types of honeybee. So your worker brood is the bulk of what you're going to be seeing in your hive. This is a nice flat capped piece of hive here. Um, this is an excellent pattern. You see very little holes in this. This is a good laying queen right here. And this is what you wanna see. Drone brood is present throughout part of the year, particularly in the early spring and summer months. Um, 
a lot of beekeepers will remove drone comb, particularly if it is a full frame or quite a bit of the frame. And there are a couple different reasons for this. It's taking up valuable real estate for one. And for two, drones take a little bit longer to hatch than workers, which makes them prime targets for burrow mites. Burrow mites can have a couple of extra life cycles on drone brood, so they prefer to habitate inside drone cells. So it's kind of a form of varroa control, getting rid of the drone brood as well. Um, having excess drone brood during certain times of year can kind of point you to problems with your queen too. If you have a failing queen, maybe she doesn't have enough uh, sperm left over. She's laying unfertilized eggs, which are drones. So that can kind of point you towards maybe you need to replace your queen. You maybe need to look into this a little bit further. But having excess drone brood usually isn't the really great thing. Uh, peak season, you'll usually see, um, I think it's about 10 to 15% of your population will be drones. Uh, getting into bee breeds, we talked about this briefly with the drones showing colors. Um, the two main breeds that we sell here at Chenards are Italian and Carniolan bees. The Italians are the most common breed in the US. Most of the commercial beekeepers go to these guys. Um, they have very large populations. They're very gentle. They don't propolize a ton, so they're pretty easy to get into and out of the boxes. Um, they do have high comb building, so they're quick to build up, which is a boon. If you're a commercial guy and you wanna create a whole bunch of nukes, a whole bunch of packages, you want to get the most bees for the early pollination of those crops. Um, they are moderately hygienic, but they do have high drift, which can be problematic. They are more likely to go to the wrong hive by accident. So they can spread all sorts of diseases in that manner. Uh, the Carniolan breed is personally my favorite. Uh, when you look at the drones, the Italian bees are going to be your classic gold and black. Your Carniolan drones are almost full black. So they're really pretty bees. They're originally from Slovenia and Austria versus the boot of Italy, so slightly different climates. Um, the Carniolans are slightly more suited to our climate here in Oregon. So they'll forage earlier in the day, they'll forage on wetter days than most breeds. Um, they have a pretty fast buildup in spring, but it really depends on how much forage they have in the area. The cool thing about the Carniolans is the queens will regulate her brood production based on what's available in nature. So if there's not a whole lot of food, she'll be slow to build up. If there's a ton of food, she'll be pretty quick. But um, in the wetter climates up here, it's, it's good to see that because if you have a bad year, you'll have a smaller, uh, smaller population going into winter and you won't have as many mouths to feed, you're less likely to starve. They are very hygienic bees. They don't usually have very many brood diseases. Um, they have a little robbing instinct, which is pretty cool. Uh, the Italians, I think, are quite a bit more likely to rob from other colonies. Carniolans are less likely to build burr comb, but they do propolize quite a bit. So you're going to be pulling out your hive tool and really, really trying to pry those boxes apart. Caucasian and standard survivor are breeds that we've carried in the past. We are going to continue carrying queens for Caucasian and standard survivor stock. Uh, so if you need to requeen, uh, come to us and ask if we've got Caucasian standard survivor. Chances are we'll have some in our queen bank. Uh, the Caucasians are originally from the Central Caucasus near the Black Sea. So when you're talking mad honey, you're usually talking Caucasian bees. Um, not to say that they'll produce mad honey because there's just not enough density rhododendrons in the area, but they are black with gray or silver hairs. So if you look at the the bees here, it's really interesting. Even the workers will show a little bit of discoloration. I have a Caucasian hive at home and they've finally gotten to the point where the entire stock is Caucasian. I had a Carniolan hive, requeened it with a Caucasian queen, and now they're starting to show these color traits, which is really interesting. They have the longest tongue out of all the bee breeds, so they are able to forage where some other bees can't. Um, kind of a downside here, they're gentle, but they do have genetics in there from Russian stock and German stock. So once they're provoked, it's going to take them a while to calm down. 
typically, if, if I have a hive that's gotten a little bit out of hand, if I put them back together, leave them alone for 10 minutes or so, they've calmed down to the point where I can finish my task. So it's, it's not a deal breaker. It's just something to be concerned about. If you get these bees, it can be a little bit more rambunctious, which can also be a boon. If you've got a bunch of robbers in the area, they're going to be more likely to fend them off. If you've got a bear in the area, they're more likely to actually get the nose and just scare him off a bit. Um, that being said, a bear is a bear, and if a bear wants the hive, it'll, it will get it. Caucasians have a pretty low swarming instinct. They have strong populations. Um, they're similar to the carnial, and so a lot of the same traits apply there. They prefer forage early in the mornings and in, on cooler weather days. Your standard survivor, um, it's bred for certain characteristics, so they do change from time to time, but the characteristics that they're bred into, um, you're looking for hygiene, so fewer brood diseases, um, maybe some mite biting traits here, low propolizing, high populations, low swarming instinct, good foraging activity like your Caucasian and your Carniolan. Um, essentially, these are the mutts of the bee world. And if you like dogs, mutts are always the best. So they're definitely a way to go. Um, as far as packages versus nukes, if you're a brand new beekeeper, um, really important to know the difference because there's a difference in time of arrival. There's a difference in um, installation. And there's definitely a big difference in comfort level. The package bees arrive the earliest. They are also the cheapest because they are an artificial swarm. You're getting bees, you're not getting wax, you're not getting resources, you're not getting brood, you're just getting bees. So this is a package, a three pound package, about 10,000 bees, a queen, and a feeding can. Um, it's good to start these bees with drawn frames so they can immediately begin storing uh, resources, but you can start with a fresh start with a package. I actually did it with my very first hive. Um, I started with the package on absolutely nothing. They had uh, just right cell foundation in their hives. And it is the most beautiful thing, that fresh white wax. But you do have to really keep on top of these guys because they can't store things right away. So you have to keep the food on. You have to keep the protein patties in. You have to keep the sugar syrup on if you're going to be starting fresh with a package. Uh, the installation is also a little bit nerve wracking for beginner beekeepers. You have to be pretty comfortable with them because you're going to be taking that package and really shaking it into your hive. It's kind of a violent looking thing, but they've got really strong carapaces and you're not going to hurt them. But definitely a little intimidating to dump out 10,000 bees. <laughs> um, another boon to getting a package is they're really easy to treat early on. They have no brood to begin with, and most Varroa medications don't get through cap brood, so you'd have to do multiple applications of medicine, medication. No brood means one application and you're good. Um, usually I will use Apigard on package bees. Um, I'll let them get settled. I'll let them have some, some protein patty after probably about five days. That's, that's when I'll do my treatment. I'll wipe out all of the mites all at once because they are simply the mites on the adult bees. Let's see. Getting into nukes. Um, for a beginner beekeeper, this is a lot more comfortable. It's really easy to transfer. Um, nuke is short for nucleus hive. So it's basically the heart of the hive. It's a miniature portable hive with frames taken from strong commercial hives. Um, so you're going to get kind of a mixing bag of bees in here. You're going to need to treat still, um, but you've got your five drawn frames and different beekeepers will have different uh, configurations of frames. Uh, the nukes we usually see around here, I think I've got my numbers scrambled a little bit here. You have uh, three frames of brood. You have a frame of uh, nectar and bee bread, and then you have an empty frame for expansion if they have to stay in the nuke for a little while but they're incredibly easy to install because all you have to do is you open up the nuke box and you transfer the frames into your, into your new box. And you dump the box out a little bit too, but it's not like a package. It's, it's very, very easy. 
The nuke boxes themselves are really handy. You can use them as uh, swarm catchers. You can use them for emergency splits. If you think your hive is going to swarm and you need to give them more room, but you don't have another box yet, you can split into a nuke and recombine later. Uh, there's all sorts of cool things that you can do with nuke boxes. Uh, the nukes are typically more expensive and they do arrive about a month later. Typically, your packages are going to come in somewhere around mid-April. Your nukes are going to be coming about a month after that. Swarms. So if you're going the cost-effective route, swarms are definitely the way to go. Um, the downside is they aren't guaranteed. If you are looking to catch swarms, uh, getting into your local beekeeper groups, definitely a boom here. Um, there is a phone tree at Lynn Benton Beekeepers Association that you can apply for. And then if you're comfortable uh, capturing swarms, say in Albany or in Corvallis or in Plymouth or a specific part of those locations, you can sign up for that. Um, you do have to have the time to do it. Swarms don't stick around for very long. So once you get the call, you basically go straight out there, capture the swarm, and bring it back. And swarms are fairly easy to capture depending on their location. So if they're in a tree branch, it's really easy to just shake that tree branch, have them fall directly into the box. You wait about 10 minutes for them to all finish coming in. But the idea is they come after the queen. So if you get the queen in the box, the rest of the bees follow. And then you can easily transfer them back. Um, depending on where the swarm is, where they've settled, you may need different equipment. You may need a ladder, you may need a bee brush or a smoker, or you may need um, actual, uh, uh, I guess, let's say power tools to get into people's walls, but that's a whole different can of worms. So we're not gonna get into that today. Extraction swarms are, not for the faint of heart. So let's just stick with swarms on branches for now. <laughs> um, about capturing swarms though, timing is definitely something you want to consider because a swarm different months of the year is going to be more or less viable in your hive. Uh, I've got just a little limerick up here. Um, a swarm in May is worth a load of hay. A swarm in June is worth the silver spoon, but a swarm in July ain't worth a fly. And that really mostly means that if you capture a swarm early, you have plenty of time to build them up, to get them to draw their comb, to get them to raise their brood, that they can make it through winter. If you catch a swarm in July, chances are they didn't swarm because they're hoping to expand. They swarm because there was a problem. Maybe the mite loads were high, maybe they ran out of space, uh, all sorts of different things. But the idea is if you capture a swarm in July and you have a brand new hive for them, they may not be populous enough or strong enough or collect enough resources to make it through the winter. So it gets pretty iffy in July. I have had a, uh, a swarm in June before and it made it through the winter just fine, but that's about the cutoff is mid-June. And of course, different years mean different things. So this is a, a general thing here. But most of the time you wanna stop capturing your, your swarms around June. Uh, briefly going over inspections and feeding, we actually have an entire class devoted to inspections and feeding coming up, I think uh, in the next month or two. So this is just one slide, just briefly covering right here. Um, you're going to want to do your hive inspections once every two weeks. Um, when you first get your package and you don't have any drawn frames, you want to be feeding as much as possible. So if you have the feeder like in the bottom photo here, this is um, a top feeder in a Vivaldi inner cover that holds about a gallon of sugar syrup. I refill this about once a week when I first get a package. So you're going to have to keep up on that. But actual hive inspections you want to do once every two weeks. That's when you take your boxes apart, you take a look at some of your frames, you look at the undersides of your frames, you make sure you know exactly what's going on with all of your frames in your hive. You are looking for expansion. You're looking for the health of your bees. You're looking for good brood pattern. You wanna make sure that your queen is healthy. So if you see um, spotty brood pattern, lots of empty holes, maybe there's something wrong with your queen. Maybe it's just the weather, uh, but you wanna keep an eye on the brood patterning. Um, 
the reason every two weeks is mostly for swarm control. So a queen bee takes 16 days to hatch. If you check once every 14 days, you're not going to have a virgin queen emerge and you're going to really be able to suppress your swarming instincts and keep your colony in your hive boxes. Um, as far as what to feed and when, in the springtime, you are simulating a light nectar flow. You're getting them ready, you're getting them building. Um, so that is one part sugar to one part water. Really easy to mix. You don't really even have to heat it. Um, they'll drink it up pretty quickly. And you wanna keep that feeder as full as possible for as long as possible. It's going to increase your wax and your brood production. So it's really gonna help your, your hive build up. But make sure to take your feed off when you put your honey super on because you don't want to take the sugar water for your table. Um, in the fall, when you're trying to build up that population after you've taken your honey, um, you want them to be actually storing that sugar syrup solution. So it's gonna be a thicker solution for a heavy nectar flow. It's two parts sugar to one part water, which is quite a bit harder to mix. But if you're like me and you've got a couple different hives, you can get a five gallon bucket and a drill paddle on your drill and you just mix it in a five gallon bucket. So works out pretty well. Um, the most important thing to note is you can heat it, but you cannot boil it. It has a chemical change when you start boiling the sugar water and it actually will poison the bees. So please don't boil. You can warm it a little bit to ease the mixing process, but make sure you don't get your sugar syrup too hot. Um, protein feed is also really important. The protein, uh, the protein patties that we have here are pollen substitutes. So if there's not a lot of pollen available in the environment, you can supplement their feed with these protein patties. What I like to do is I like to just keep a protein patty on all year round. And then the faster they consume it, the more I'll put on, the slower they consume it, the smaller portion I'll put in. So I can use a full patty in the springtime when there's not too much pollen around and they're consuming it quickly, or in the summertime when they've got quite a bit of stuff going on and they're out, out foraging, they prefer the natural pollen and I'll put a smaller portion in. But if I always have protein in the hive, I can keep tabs on how quickly they're eating it and how much they're uh, foraging just in the environment. Integrated pest management. Um, basically, there's no colony without girl mites. So you have to treat in some fashion or another. If you have a high varroa account going into winter, it's almost a certain death sentence for the bees. So at some point you do need to really do your research on which medication you wanna use and when you want to use it. We typically treat our bees about four times a year. So you'll be treating right away once you get your packages, your nukes, you'll be treating um, possibly right before your honey flow, right after your honey flow, and then right before winter sets in. And some people will actually for or will actually um, treat for bromides during winter as well with oxalic acid. Um, oxalic acid is kind of a whole nother can of worms, which I'm not going to get into today. But if you check out your local beekeeping clubs, they have quite a bit more information on oxalic acid than I do. So Apigard, um, we we don't carry any synthetic miticides here at the store. We only carry naturally based. So apigard is actually an extract from a thyme plant. So it's the herb that you usually use. Um, this is most effective on broodless bees. So if you just get a package, you have no brood, you have no bee babies, you're treating for phoretic mites or mites on adult bees, one dose of this and it'll wipe them out. So what you do when you get your package is you'll install your package, you'll feed your package, you'll give them sugar syrup, you'll give them protein, and you'll let them wait for five to seven days. Let them get settled, let them know that this is home, they have food, they're not going to abscond. Um, they've begun drawing some wax, but they haven't really started brooding yet. This is when you treat with one tray of Apigard. Um, Apigard comes in two tray packets, but for a package, you're only going to use one tray per package. A full colony situation, you are going to use both of those trays, 
but we're talking about early packaging, small population, no brood. Uh, treatment is typically complete after seven to 14 days or when the tree is empty. Your instructions say seven to 14 days, depending on the temperature and your, your actual queen and colony, your hygienic uh, traits here. Sometimes the tray can be empty within three or four days. Uh, you remove the tray and continue feeding and building your colony strength for the summer nectar flow. It's important to do mite checks here and there, but we are gonna get into mite checks in the next class as well. So I'm just gonna leave it at that for now. Um, hive inspections and problem solving is the title of the next class. And that's probably gonna be in the next month or so. You can watch a short video of an application of Apicard and Formic Pro on our YouTube channel. I've got the link down below. Or if you're looking at this on YouTube, you probably have already seen it or already know what it is. This is formic acid. Uh, formic acid is a natural acid occurring in lots of living things. Um, it is basically kind of what makes ants smell bad, but this is incredibly concentrated. It is very easy to apply. It's just like applying a protein patty. Um, you do have to be really careful when you're handling this though. You don't want it to touch your skin and you don't want it to get too close to your nose. I have a really weak nose, and this stuff is kind of like liquid ammonia. If you sniff it, it'll send you straight to the barbed wire fence. So keep it away from your nose. And if you don't smell that acrid scent, you know it's not active. If you don't smell that terrible smell, come to me and I'll get you another one because it's, it's some nasty stuff, but it's very effective. Um, when you get your nucleus colony, you're going to have five frames in your nuke. And it's important that you have all five frames drawn before you use your formic acid. It's very strong and you don't want too small of a population when you use it, or you could damage your queen, you could damage your brood. So like I said before, that nuke usually comes with an empty frame for expansion. You wanna wait until that frame is completely full, your bees have begun expanding before you use this treatment. So you install your nuke, you feed your nuke with sugar and protein, you let them begin to build. Usually this takes two to three weeks until they're established and actually beginning to expand. Um, with a new colony, this isn't a full-size colony. So if you read the instructions, it's gonna tell you to use two strips. This is way too much for a brand new colony. So use one strip perpendicular to frames, and that's gonna be good enough for your new. Um, the cool thing about formic acid is it's one of the few medications that does get through your brood. So if you have capped brood, it's still effective on the capped brood. Most of your mite medications don't do this. Uh, this is also a medication that the FDA has approved for use during honey supering. I absolutely don't recommend it, but just throwing it out there, if you have an emergency you have to treat while you are honey supering, you can remove the honey super for then and treat, but the FDA has approved use during honey supering as well. Um, we are going to go over more on Formic Pro and hive inspections and problem solving later on as well. Uh, but like I mentioned before, you can check out our YouTube channel and I have a video of me actually applying the formic acid to a hive out back as well. Um, just a word of warning, the hardest part about applying this isn't the smell and it's not the application, it's getting the package open. It's got some really terrible Ziploc things on it and be patient, take your gloves off to open the package because it'll give you some trouble. That being said, kids are not ever gonna be able to get into this stuff. So that's that's pretty good. <laughs> it's child-proof, adult-proof, beekeeper-proof, you name it. <laughs> I've been known to just get the scissors out. So we've got quite a few online resources. Um, you can check out our, our, our actual website at shenards.com for lots of written resources, good photos here. Um, a lot of these were from beekeepers before me. So we've got a collective information from lots of different sources on here. Um, you can check out the Varroa management tools at honeybeehealthcoalition.org. It's not just your Varroa management. They've got all sorts of cool information on their website as well. And you can always check out all of our video tutorials on YouTube. So this class will be there. Um, all of our previous classes will be there and then we'll have five or 10 minute shorts as well. So. There's a plethora of information if, you, if you'd like to look.
As far as books go, it's always good to have a good book on hand. Um, the best sources that I've found for the money are uh, the Beekeeper's Handbook. OSU uses this as uh, their textbook a lot of times in their beekeeping programs. It's fairly inexpensive. This is a brand new edition and it has so much information on there. There's hive configurations, there's different um, brood diseases, there's mite control, there's wintering, everything in there. Lots of really cool graphs, life cycles and biology. Um, the hive and the honeybee and honeybee biology and beekeeping are both classic textbooks. They are insanely expensive, but you get what you pay for. They have lots of really awesome authors. They've got uh, full color photos. Uh, the Hive and the Honeybee is actually a collection of authors. So all of the people who wrote this book, they spent their life's work on the chapter basically. And they've also got a pretty cool sense of humor. So you read the book and it's not really like a textbook. Uh, that's my favorite part about it is they all, they all have a sense of humor. The Backyard Beekeeper is kind of interesting because it has not only different hive configurations for Langstroth, but it also covers top bar hive beekeeping. So if you're into top bar hive beekeeping or horizontal, you'll find some information here, which will be pretty awesome. Um, Garden Plants for Honeybees. I love this book. Um, each chapter is a different month. Full color photos. It has a five-star rating of pollen and nectar of each plant. So you have seasonality, you have full color photos, you've got all sorts of really cool information. The problem with this is it's out of print. So I wish you the best of luck in finding it, but it's a wonderful resource if you can. Um, we have several other books on forage for honeybees out at our Shemarns bookshelf. So definitely welcome to check it out there. And I think that's just about all I have for you today. So uh, let's open it up at first for uh, people in the classroom itself, and then we'll move on to anyone who has questions in Zoom. Nothing right now, good job. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Oh, thank you. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I do have one question. You had mentioned about where you're setting up the, um, your hives, uh, the concern about wind on the entrance. Mm -hmm. We have a, Pretty strong afternoon wind in the summer. And so, of course, we can position it to kind of, but generally, would they, is that conducive to? The wind can definitely be a problem. So, if you have, like you said, your, your afternoon wind on the entrance, that can make it so your bees are less likely to want to fly in and out. They're more likely to be blown off course. Um, so, it's harder for them to get in and out of the hive. You can do a couple different things. Uh, wind blocks are pretty effective. Some people will use hay bales right next to there. And so you'll still get a little bit of breeze through there. You get some ventilation. You'll still get some sun, but you're not going to see the wind quite as much. You can tilt your hive a little bit so the angle's a little bit better. You can use all sorts of different things, really. Okay. But you do want to minimize the wind as much as you can. Okay. Um, anybody else? Okay, let's move on to Zoom. Um, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves or uh, pop into chat here. I have a question. Okay. Um, we have a shed and I, and I was concerned about putting it in there since um, the uh, hives, since they won't get sun during the day. Um, is it better to keep them out of a little shed then? Are you talking like um, you have your beehive in the shed with the entrance leading out? Yeah, so there'd be a, a wide opening to the east, uh, okay. but the three three sides are covered and the and the roof is covered. As long as the entrance itself has light on it, then you should be fine. This is similar to your Slovenian or AZ hives, actually. So the entire beehive is inside the building. The entrance is what's really important to have exposed to the sun. Okay, I was concerned about, you said it would be better to have too much sun than rather than too much shade. Mm -hmm. But your, your Slovenian cabinets have got the nice insulation, they've got the warmth, and the entrance is really what you're really focused on getting the sun. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right, I think I'm gonna wrap it up then. Thanks everyone for joining and have a wonderful afternoon.
Thank you very much.